Hi, and welcome to Her Business, where we interview inspiring businesswomen and entrepreneurs. I'm Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network. My guest today is Steve Sammartino, author of The Great Fragmentation and Why the Future of Business is Small. Steve started his first business at age 10, running an egg farm in his backyard. He spent many years in marketing and advertising at executive levels and escaped his cubicle in 2005 to found Rentoid.com, a peer-to-peer renting portal. His debut book is the subject of today's interview. It's called The Great Fragmentation, and it was released in late 2004. I really enjoyed speaking with him and in this interview we talk about how to create valuable content in the super competitive fragmented economy, why knowing your customer demographics may no longer matter. We talk about how technology really disrupts old business models and what to do about it. The benefits of being number one in your niche and if you listen to this program often you'll know I'm a big fan of niches. We also look at what the old rules around product price, place, promotion, the four P's, what they mean in a digital age and how they've changed. Let's go on now to the interview. You'll find more information about this interview on our website at abn.org.au forward slash her business forward slash fragmentation. Welcome to the program. Hello, Susie. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for joining us for what will be the final episode of Her Business for this year. Um, we're talking about your book, The Great Fragmentation. Congratulations, firstly, on the book. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> now, you start out by telling us that the simplest way to investigate change in our economic system is by looking at what we call parts of the marketing mix, and that's the four Ps. Take us through those very quickly. Yeah, the four Ps is a, a traditional marketing concept. And it's the elements that are in all businesses, no matter what we do. And so the, it, they, they are product, price, place, and promotion. So the product is what we sell. That's the service or uh, the product we make or the widget. The price is obviously how we generate our revenue, which might be direct or indirect. The place is where we sell it. And historically, it used to be in the traditional retailers, and we know how much that has changed. And the promotion is the way we communicate with the market and let them know what we've got. And so all of those have changed quite radically in the last 10 years. And so I thought it would be a good structure to take people through what's changing in business and how technology is impacting it. Great. And we're going to have a look at those in sort of an abstract sort of way and come back to them at the end of today's interview. I want to start with social media because it is one of the changes that we're moving through. And you tell us that a focus on social media strategy, something I've sort of flown the flag for myself, is flawed by definition. What do you mean by that? Well, and and, and I, I have also been a social media flag flyer for a long time as well. Blogging and Twitter and, and all of those tools have been incredibly powerful for me. But I, I feel as though they're the entree uh, to what we're doing. And Social, rather than being a strategy itself, is really just a tool we can use uh, in generality. And I just, I think that um, it, it's a small part of what's happening. And my view is that social is more than just a way to connect and promote your business. I actually think it's a form of collective sentience where we are starting to work out a way to connect with each other when we're geographically displaced and becoming like a collective human spirit. And I think that's why there's so much entrepreneurship and startups and there's a real movement happening um, is because we're starting to form almost a collective mind and so I think it's actually more than just a way to connect and promote with people I actually think it's almost like the next step in human communication in, in, in a wider viewpoint rather than just a simple business strategy. That's great I really like that idea and it feels very comfortable for me but it totally changes the way that any small business would think about their social media. So thank you for that. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a focus in the book on moving away from mass marketing and towards niche marketing. And you say that strategies that work over the long term are more human, less selfish. Can you explain that? Yeah. So I think that during the industrial era, and that's what's happening, we're moving from the industrial age to the technology age. So this is like an epoch shift akin to when we move from the agriculture age to the industrial age and so on. So it's a 200-year shift and it's really big. Now, the thing that defined the industrial age was scarcity. It was limited resources. And so the people who could afford to provide 
products en masse or services en masse were just the most powerful and large corporations and they had uh, a system set up. Everything was mass. It was mass manufacturing. It was mass distribution. It was mass media. And the thing that kept those mass alive, those mass ideas alive, were uh, the factors of production were really expensive. And so these mass marketers had a vested interest in selling a limited number of products uh, and, and delivering those products to you. And so it was selfish in that they wouldn't really give you what you wanted. They would give uh, what the system allowed. Mm. And the system was, was really calling for mass because that's how mass distribution, mass marketing, mass business survived. And the simple thing that I tell people to think back on is when I grew up, and I'm giving away my age here, <laughs> uh, I had three TV stations uh, to choose from, right? So I was like, I really hope what you, you like uh, what is on channel 7, 9 or 10 because that's all you've got. And uh, and so now we know that that's proliferated and fragmented into, you know, millions of channels on demand. I remember when I went to the store, uh, if, if I went to a mass merchant, you know, you there's five pairs of runners or three brands to choose from. Uh, and so all of the products and the services that were delivered to us, they suited the manufacturer more than they suited us. And so the job of advertising was to convince us that that is what we should want. And what we've seen recently is this move away from a selfish form of marketing where we're, we're getting shoehorned into mass products and you know, mass music and mass everything into a time where we can choose what we want. But, and so we've got this fragmentation. If someone doesn't sell what you want, well, we can go and buy it online. Um, if the, the groups around you are into different things, you can connect with anyone around the world who cares about what you care about. And so what we have now is a more human-based economy where people can find like minds. We can sell things uh, to people who want to buy what we want to buy. Years ago, historically, mm. we had to hope we had enough people in our geographic catchment area to sell to well now we can have a niche market but operate globally and so we can serve humans who care about what we care about rather than just the mass businesses uh, selling to us what they can make and so that fragmentation creates a more human atmosphere in business. Mm, we're going to talk a little more about niches in just a moment because it's one of my passions. I want to look at demographics because often uh, as a business when we're looking towards who are our potential customers, we're looking at demographics and you tell us that they're no longer an accurate measure or starting point. Yeah, I mean, the thing with demographics, and it's easy to forget, is that demographics were designed as a way to try and guess who might care about what we've got, okay? So it was a statistical measure that could estimate the probability of how people would behave. And the thing is, is that we used to behave like an 18 to 24-year-old female or, you know, a, a married 40-year-old with kids because of the mass products that were served up to us. We used to behave the same way because if you're in a certain age bracket or ge a geographic area, you got served up the same things yes. to people who also shared your demographic profile. And so now because what we have access to and what we know about and what we like has changed, then we're, we're fragmenting away from the things that used to define our attitudes because we have more choice. And so demographics now is not as good a measure as it used to be. There are certain demographics uh, like age that, that I think still has an impact certainly as you get older. There are certain things that can still define us as people, but they're less and less accurate because we have so much more choice. So just to assume that someone who lives in a certain area with a certain age and a certain education will have the same interests or purchase the same products is, I think, fraught with danger. And I can give you some personal examples. Sure. So all of the people that I hang out with, I didn't even know five or ten years ago because we found each other on social. We found people who we care about. One of my best friends is a 19-year-old kid who lives in Romania who doesn't have the same education as me. He doesn't have a... Uh, he doesn't have a degree. He's obviously geographically displaced from where I am. He comes from a former communist country. 30 years ago, we weren't even allowed to talk to each other. And so, um, and we're interested in the same things and we found each other online. We did the crazy Lego car project together. And so that's just one simple example of how demographics don't necessarily define the way people behave. And because we, we work in such a, a way where we connect uh, geographically away from each other, and we have different interests, it's really changed demographics. So I don't think they're the type of measure uh, that matters. And the thing that matters more now is what I call the interest graph. And you might have heard 
Mark Zuckerberg or other people talk about that. And that's the layer of things we're interested in. It's far more important to us than the demographic profile of what we might be interested in. Now we're at a stage with digital data where we don't have to guess what people are interested in. We can actually find what they're exactly interested in and that's the measure we should be using to connect with people. Perfect. And so we're talking about the fact that we can niche right down to a very specific group like, you know, your Lego car creation or it can be as as bizarre, not that that's bizarre, but as bizarre as you like and, there's a, and you'll find a tribe of people who are doing that. Um, I belong to a tribe called CrossFitters, you know, and they're people who like a particular style of exercise, but you'll find them all over the world in these tiny little gyms in, you know, <laughs> the, the back exactly. of wherever. But no matter what the niche is, you're saying that we should provide niche content to that niche that we've chosen or curate the madness of content deluge. So tell us about this madness of content deluge and what you're asking us to do. Yeah, and so now that everyone has the tools of production in their hands, anyone can create everything. And so the types of ways we can create value with connection and content are, are twofold. We either need to create content for this micro niche that we serve, like the CrossFitters, or we need to curate from the data that is just coming, all those articles we want to read, there's a lot of value creation in curating that content and helping us find the good stuff. So um, they're the two ways that we can connect with people is the service of removing all the noise and creating value and saying, hey, here is the stuff that matters this week or connecting directly with your audience and creating specific content for that audience. They're the two real ways uh, to create value. And I think networks like, you know, the Australian Business Women's Network and, and, and others do, do that exceptionally well. And, uh, you know, podcasting in general and a couple of newsletters that I sign up to, I've got one that, that I read every week because I know that in technology and design, that's the one that's going to have the, the five good articles that I should read. And so I don't have to worry every week, oh, gee, if I missed something important in my business realm, I can just rely on that Wednesday email that has, you know, enough for me to stay in touch. And so if you can develop a connection with your audience where they can say, hey, Susie's going to deliver uh, mm. a great podcast for me every week and I know that if I listen to that, I'm going to be up to date with the things that matter in my realm. That's when you'll get customer loyalty. You actually, just on that point, say that we should be the channel of choice in our niche. So how do we establish this position as being that reliable source when there's so much competition? You know, I, I, I think about the old-fashioned way of doing it. I, I call it, you know, compound effort just like compound interest in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so when I started blogging, you know, I blogged to, to my, my dad, my mum and my cat. No one was reading. <laughs> but the thing that I know that if you deliver good content to, to a niche audience, what happens is the dynamics of the web, you know, meta tagging and search engine optimization will mean that your audience will find you. And if you deliver good content and someone, just that one person who starts reading likes it enough, they're going to tell one friend who's going to tell one other friend. But this takes time. It's like deposits in the bank, in the content bank. Mm -hmm. But I know for sure that if we deliver that over a, a long period of time, that uh, that's how you get people attracted to what you do. And they're more sticky, to use a 1990s web word. So, <laughs> so the people who really care about what you do are going to be those loyal ones. And so you just need to deliver good content. Of course, you need to have you know the mechanics of your optimization right and and do those types of things. But it's the same with Twitter. You know, I've got 5,000 followers that I've never chased a follower ever, but I know that the people who follow me are really listening. You know, I might not have many thousands, but I know that um, because I deliver value, they really care about what I have to say. And so that's what we need to do. We need to, you know, it's like CrossFit. Hey, you've got to, you've got to do the exercise over a long period of time and then you'll, you'll get that, um, that compounding um, result happening. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about hacking because the term hacking has, we've been conditioned to think that hacking is a bad thing and it's things these teenagers in their boxer shorts do in dark rooms to, <laughs> to ruin our online experience. But you talk about hacking as a way, just as a way to get around a system in order to get a better outcome. And you encourage us to self-hack. Tell us what you mean. Yeah, so hacking is to me probably the, the most important thing that's happened on the web. And, and it's a reflection of uh, if a company or a customer doesn't give us what we need, we will find an alternative method because uh, there's no longer a door. The gatekeepers are evaporating. 
And because we're connected, see, knowledge gives us access to everything. Once we're connected, we can find an answer. One of my really favorite examples of, of hacking is when retailers would refuse to sell certain products in Australia. Yes. And so, <laughs> and so, and they would even try and block you on a website. They'd say, sorry, we don't deliver that product to Australia. Right. So then you would get entrepreneurs starting up the idea of hacking where they become a delivery service in the US where they'll go shopping for you and then send you that exact product. So for me, that's a classic example of hacking where the customer in Australia is looking for someone and then the entrepreneur in America is looking for a way to help people solve their problems. And so we're using the information and the power of connection to hack a system. But the other thing that we need to do in business is we need to understand that if we've developed some value somewhere, someone will try and hack us. And so what I tell large companies and small companies is what would you do if you were your own competitor? If you were your customer and you, is there any gaps that you would be unhappy with where you would want to hack that system? And then our job as business people becomes to hack our own system. And if we're doing that, hacking ourselves like that shopping example, then we'll make sure we're always at the leading edge of serving our customers well. So we need to imagine uh, someone else trying to hack our system and do it ourselves instead. And that could be related to distribution. It could be related to pricing. It could even be related to product comes back to those four Ps. And when we see someone hacking, they're generally hacking one of the Ps. The example that I gave you was a distribution hack mm. because they wouldn't distribute the product, so people found a way to hack around it. If we're hacking ourselves, then we can be sure that we're always delivering the best service and we've got a more sustainable business. Mm. On the same, in the same sort of vein, the term disruption is one that I have a love-hate relationship with, Steve. <laughs> I hear it, every second person is a disruptor and it's like, no, you're not. But, uh, <laughs> but we're hearing this term a lot and we find the term in the book uh, referenced in the area of innovation. And you say that companies have to disrupt themselves and try to put themselves out of business. Once again, would you explain what this concept is? Yeah, so the thing that's happened with this 200-year shift or this revolution we're living through, this technology revolution, is that uh, the infrastructure is changing. It's actually, the thing that's interesting is that the way we go to market and the business methods are changing quite radically. And so... What that means is that the old ways we used to solve problems, and that's what a business is. A business solves a problem with a service or a product. They find new ways to be solved. So television's a simple example. Television used to be set over you know, bandwidth across the air, and that was why there was a limited number of channels. And so the problem they solved was entertainment, news, and so on. But now those things can be solved over the internet, right. and that's a new infrastructure that solves that problem. And the reason people get disrupted is because the business usually gets built around an infrastructure. But when there's a new infrastructure built, you get disrupted because you're married to the old infrastructure. And that's why large businesses struggle because their revenue is usually attached to the old infrastructure. The reason they need to self-disrupt is that they need to build new ways to solve old problems. And in manufacturing, 3D printing will be a new way to solve an old problem. A lot of the plastic widgets and different things we buy, you know, that fill up our house 10 years from now, we'll have our little 3D printer and do desktop manufacturing in much the same the way we've done desktop publishing. So desktop publishing disrupted the old mass printers that we yes. used to go and get things printed. And so the new tools that came along disrupted that because that was new infrastructure. And so we need to look at the business systems we use to connect or solve our customers' problems. And if there's a chance that that business system or infrastructure will be replaced, then that's when we need to self-disrupt. Mm, thank you. So to bring it all kind of to a close, let's look again at the four Ps and how um, they're unrecognisable compared to, you say, the pre-technology digital age version of themselves. Would you walk us through, I guess, an overview of you know, really why are they now recognisable product, price, place, promotion? Yeah. So if we start with product, we can see that the first thing is uh, availability. I'll just go with availability. Years ago, we had limited products available. Whatever could fit on the shelf, that was what was available. I mean, in music, the average music store could fit about 1,000 CDs in it. Well, now on iTunes, you've got millions and millions of, of um music CDs, MP3s available at your disposal. It's the same with the store. You know, if you went to a store, there was a shoe store, you know, they can fit 200 lines of different shoes in there. Well, now you've got every shoe available in the world from every market on demand. 
Um, the other thing that's happened with, with product too is because we have availability, we get global best price. And so years ago, you had to be a price uh, taker. So you take whatever the retailer sells it for. Now, consumers are price makers. So we get to the point where it's like, well, no, if I want this homogeneous product, I'll just get the best price. I'll look online and I'll find it. So price, now we get a, a, a downward pressure on price on products that are homogeneous. But on products that are different and niche, we get to be the price maker. Right. So if we're selling something that's niche and for our specific audience, we can um, determine the price because we're providing something of value that's unique and we can find enough customers because they don't all have to live where I live. So, so price is also um, on homogeneous products is becoming more equalised around the world and fairer. But on niche products, um, it's becoming uh, up to the seller of, of who creates the niche. So that's what's happening with price. Mm -hmm. And I think globalisation is having a big impact on that. Oh, another thing on, on, on product is 3D printing. It's not quite there yet, but um, 3D printing will have a radical impact on product availability because we can print pretty much in any material known to man already. We can already uh, print uh, you know, electrical components with 3D printers. I know it sounds crazy. We've printed body parts yes. and all sorts of things. So, I mean, anyone who just spends 10 minutes on YouTube looking at 3D printing evolution, we'll see how radical that's going to be. Um, also the Internet of Things, which people might know about, which is turning little products into computers with sensors and so on, that's going to have a big impact on product. If we think about place or distribution, as it's also known, well, we are now omni-channel retailers. It's expected that if you sell anything, it needs to be available online and in all of the online stores, um, you know, at on demand, so we can get anything from the world now with a few keystrokes. So that's radically changed just from five or ten years ago. Um, and promotion, I mean, this is where social media comes in. I mean, the idea that you had to be able to afford a mass advertising campaign or even an advertising campaign in your local uh, newspaper in the past was a way to tell people about what you're doing. Well, now you can do it free, connecting on blogs, podcasts and social media and Twitter and Facebook. Or you can pay for really cheap advertising, AdWords or um, even Facebook dark posts. You can reach a 1,000 people for 30 cents. I mean, you know, a 1,000 people on TV costs $37 and you need a minimum spend of around about 100,000 to get onto TV. So that's to reach you a 1,000 people at a time. So... That is, is, is a radical difference. And the overriding trend with these four Ps and the change is what I would say democratised. It's actually available to all of us. You don't have to be a big, powerful corporation to participate. And that's great for the world because it means we can get the products we want from the people we care about. And we can design the world and the future and commerce in a way that we want. I think it's damn exciting. You know? mm. So the change in these is democratising business. And, and I think that not only you know, in... in we can have an opinion in politics now on Twitter or if a company does a bad thing, we can tweet it out and we'll get support. But more than that, we can participate in designing great products and services for people that are more human in nature. It's very exciting and there are lots of opportunities. But which area of fragmentation are you most excited about for 2015? Yeah, the thing I'm really excited about is the Internet of Things. I think, I think it's such a, a, a simple thing to do. The Internet of Things is when we put... Um, little pieces of technology on products. Um, so smart meters in a home is an example of an internet of things or a GPS locator in your runners which tells you how, how much exercise you've done is internet of things. And the reason I'm excited about it is because it's really low cost to improve your product and get technology on it. I mean, you know, one gigabyte of memory is worth about four cents. You know, a GPS is worth about $5 to buy um, and we can connect all these things with our smartphones to talk to our products. And the reason I think it's exciting is no matter what we sell, we can connect these products quite cheaply to the internet. And it's a, it's a really good way to create new, new forms of value to an existing product range. Mm. So for me, I think that's, that's really exciting. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably my favourite one just now. <laughs> the book is The Great Fragmentation, Why the Future of Business is Small. Steve Sammartino, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Susie. listening i hope you enjoyed this episode of her business with steve sammartino author of the great fragmentation get your copy of the book from your favorite bookstore you can also check it out at the publisher's website which is wiley publishing 
Learn more about Steve at his website, which is stevesamartino.com. You'll find more information about this interview on our website at abn.org.au forward slash her business forward slash fragmentation. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you would tell your friends. We want to share the great ideas that our guests bring to these interviews with as many people as possible. If you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher, um, you can subscribe to automatically receive new episodes of Her Business and to access the library of past episodes. I'd also love it if you'd be willing to leave us a rating or a review. On behalf of the Australian Business Women's Network, I want to thank you so much for joining me here on Her Business. I look forward to welcoming you back really, really soon.